Well, welcome to Lesson 45. Before we go too much uh, further, I just want to do a shout out for some friends in Texas, and that's Mary and Courtney. And you know who you are, and thank you for your faithfulness to uh, to continue to uh, to study along with us and watch the video. I'm sorry for the dryness, uh, but it's the church is on a budget here, and I'll, I'm all they could get. So, uh, and so, but we do appreciate your faithfulness, and so. Uh, uh, we're going to jump in it right here at Green Valley here in St. Joseph. And so, welcome to Lesson 45. Tonight we're going to be talking about and learn, looking at the time when Jesus rode into Jerusalem. And we're also going to talk about Jesus and his disciples and how they celebrated the, the Passover. And so if you have your Bibles, turn to Mark. We're going to start off with Mark 11 here in a few minutes. But by way of introduction, let me just kind of look back at last week at where we were and to see the things that we learned then. And so... What is far more important than being rich? Being rich in the Lord. Being rich in the Lord, that's right. Uh, believing God and having eternal life, which is beyond any comprehension. And so, in the parable of the rich man, you remember we talked about the parable of the rich man. So in that parable, why did God call the rich man a fool? Do you remember? He relied on his riches. It wasn't because it was necessarily... It was uh, because it was poor investment. He was, he was investing in the wrong things, right, Sue? Uh, according to the story Jesus told about the rich man of Lazarus, where do people go when they die? Where do they go when they die? <laughs> yeah, either to heaven or the place of everlasting punishment, right? And so... Um, why did Lazarus go to be with God and the rich man to a place of fire and eternal torment? Excuse me. Why did Lazarus go to be with God and the rich man to a place of fire and eternal torment? No compassion. No compassion. That's a good one. He didn't get it. That's right. <laughs> that's that's it. We can move on. That's true, though. It's absolutely true. Yes, sir. Before Jesus went down and took back there yeah you know they believe based on you know early biblical teachings and stuff that that might have been the case that they uh, the two weren't inter, inter, um, woven together or mixed together there was still a separation the chasm but remember there's going to be a new heavens and the new earth and so Paul talks about being caught up in the heavens as well into the, what was it, the third heaven uh, and so there's different heavens in different places. And so at this time, we believe paradise to probably be, uh, you know, somewhere similar area. But then there was Hades and there was off, obviously, according to scripture, a gulf that separated the two. And and remember, this is this is just like today in Job. This is progressive revelation. This is the beginning of the Bible. And the further along we go, the more that God continues to reveal to us in his word. And so we're going to see more on this as well. Uh, but great question. So. We learn here that because Lazarus was in, was in agreement with God about his sinful condition and was trusting in God to forgive his sin, he was able to actually go to this paradise. But the rich man in the story didn't admit that he was a sinner who needed God's forgiveness. And that's what separated him there. He didn't agree with God about his sin, nor did he repent of that sin. And so why did the rich man ask Abraham, or excuse me, what did the rich man ask Abraham to do for his brothers who are still alive. And so what do you ask him to do? Send Lazarus. Yeah, it's to send Lazarus back to warn his siblings. At least they end up with him in torment. Okay. Uh, and so what was Abraham's response to the rich man's request? They didn't believe in the other. Yeah. Remember he said that his brothers could read what Moses and the prophets had written about sin and judgment. And so even here in this story, we see an emphasis and importance of the word of God and what's been revealed in his word. And so basically, and they're not going to believe, uh, you know, if, if you send a dead person back, they'll believe, they'll believe that miracle. And he's basically saying, no, if they won't believe Moses and the prophets, they're not even going to believe in a miracle. So, so that's where we were last week. And so this week, what we're going to look at is we're going to look that God fulfills his prophecies. Now, hopefully that you kept that prophecy sheet. If you recall, we had a prophecy sheet that we give out several weeks ago. Uh, anyone still have that? In there, I forget how many prophecies, but it's got a column, uh, you know, the Old Testament prophecy. 
And then on the right column, it has a prophecy, how, how Jesus fulfilled it in the New Testament. That's it. And at the top, it says the deliver on it. Thank you, Sue. So the rest of you have lost those, right? <laughs> Gary's got one there. That's two. Okay. Oh, Wilbur, thank you, sir. Uh, and, all right, excellent. Okay, so uh, the, uh, the wardens have theirs too. Jerry, you have yours by accident. You have it backwards. <laughs> Thank you. It's also on page 121, you said, man? Okay. All right, good. Because we're going to refer to that a few times tonight. And so what we're going to see is we're going to continue to look out Jesus in, in, in this particular uh, passage, how he fulfills uh, the prophecies. And so what, we, what we're going to learn is that God does fulfill his prophecies and everything that he has foretold has or will come to pass, not a day early or a day late. And we can count on it because God is true to himself and that he will fulfill all he has planned. And so in this lesson, in this lesson, we're going to be learning about people who actually witnessed the son of God fulfilling some Old Testament prophecies. Yet they missed out on understanding who he was and what his mission really entailed. And so that's where we're going to start tonight. And so first I want us to look at this. We're going to see that the, the people welcome Jesus as he rode into Jerusalem. Could you imagine the scene? Uh, here he comes in. And, and what are some of the things, just without even digging the story, do we remember about this day when Jesus went into Jerusalem? What are some things that we remember? Palm, palms. palm Sundays, right? And so what did they do with the palms? They ate them on the yeah, they did. And, and what did Jesus ride in on? A, a white horse? <laughs> a donkey, right? Uh, and so what were the people yelling? Which means, yeah, God save us now, and so, or or another translation of that, but that's the gist of it. And so, uh, and so, if you have your Bibles, hopefully you're in Mark 11, and in Mark 11, 1 through 7, this is what we read. Now, when they drew near Jerusalem to Bethany, and Bethany and the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, that being Jesus, and he said to them. Go into the village opposite you, and as soon as you have entered it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has set. Loose it and bring it. And if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it, and immediately he will send it here. And then verse 4, so they went their way and found the colt tied by the door outside of the street, and they loosed it. Uh, but some of those who stood there said to them, what are you doing loosing the colt? And they spoke to them just as Jesus has commanded so that they let them go. And then they brought the colt to Jerusalem or to Jesus and threw his clothes on it and he sat on it. So let's stop there for a minute. Zechariah, an Old Testament prophet, predicted that the deliverer would ride into Jerusalem on a young, unbroken donkey. Now, if you have your Bibles, you can go there if you want to Zechariah chapter 9. Let's look at this prophecy real quick. And it's probably on that sheet that you have. And so Zechariah 9.9, 9, this, is, this is what we read. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just in having salvation, lowly and riding on a what? On a donkey. Now, go back to our passage there and when we look in verse 7 let me read that again then they brought the colt to, Jer to Jesus and threw their clothes on it and he said on it you see a prophecy and let's look a little bit more at this I think it says it in here uh, on your prophecy sheet it, it should be titled enter Jerusalem on a colt it was prophesied and so what we read is that the crowds welcomed Jesus look here in verses 8 through 10 in Mark and many spread their clothes on the road, and others cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then those who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And so let's stop there for a second. And let's see here that with shouts of praise, okay? This is so important. This is how Jesus enters. With shouts of praise, the people welcome Jesus as the one whom God had promised to send to be their king. 
Now think about this. Down through the years, the prophets had written about his coming. And these people believed that he had now arrived to deliver them from the Romans. Uh oh. What we have here is a failure to communicate. <laughs> well, as a result, the crowd welcomed Jesus with great enthusiasm. Sadly, however, the majority of these people were not thinking of him as the one who had come to deliver them from their sin and God's punishment. Well, let's see how this plays out. Well, the Jewish leaders planned to have Jesus killed. In the Mark 14, if you turn ahead a couple chapters, got a little bit of Bible flipping tonight, which is good. 14 verses 1 through 2, we read this. We read, so Jesus, now remember, Jesus is riding in on a donkey, as prophesied. They're, they're laying palms down for him, uh, and they're praising him, saying, Hosanna. And so, here we just a couple chapters later in Mark, we read this. And after two days, it was the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And the chief priests and the scribes thought how they might take him by trickery and put him to death. But they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar of the people. And so what do we learn here? Well, who was guiding these Jewish leaders to conspire against Jesus? Satan. That's right, Satan. And, and, and what was Satan trying to accomplish by having Jesus killed? Stop the promise. <laughs> That's right. He was trying to prevent God from carrying out his plan to save sinners. Right, Ron? Uh, this is his promise that's been carried from Genesis 3.15. And so Satan's like, I'm running out of options here. I'm running out of chances. And so uh, it's Satan behind these guys uh, that are trying to accomplish, are trying to kill Jesus. And so although the religious leaders wanted to get rid of Jesus, they were hesitant to upset the people. Now think about this scene that we just described. Jesus riding in, okay? And since Jesus was popular because of the great miracles that he has done, remember the miracles leading up to this point. He brought sight to the blind, hearing to the death. He made the lame walk again. He even raised Lazarus, his friend Lazarus, from the grave. Okay, All these great miracles. And the people are aware that this is Jesus, the miracle worker. And that's, well, yeah, nowhere in Scripture say he's, 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 you know, he's omniscient. So, nor is, he, nor is he, that's right, that's right. And so... The leaders feared that if they arrested Jesus, the people might turn on them and even kill them. Okay, and so moving along. Now, additionally, Judas, everyone knows Judas, right? Uh, I don't know anyone yet. It's probably happened that has named their child Judas. Uh, but, uh, you know, same way with Ichabod. You just don't see little Ichabods running around. There's a reason. There's a stigma attached to those names for a good reason. Okay, and so uh, Judas planned to betray Jesus. Look here in verse 10, chapter 14, verse 10. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priest to betray him to them. And so Judas was one of the twelve whom Jesus had chosen to be his closest companions. But Judas was not concerned about his own sinfulness before God. He did not trust in Jesus as his deliverer. Well... Judas followed Jesus for his own personal gain. And we're going to see this. John 12, 6 tells us that Judas was a thief. He had been given the responsibility of handling the money that was intended to assist the poor and pay for Jesus and his disciples' expenses. Judas appropriated some of this money for himself. So now consider this, okay? Considering Judas' purpose in following Jesus, what do you think... What do you think prompted him to betray Jesus to his enemies at this time? His God, which is money, right? Uh, that, that's right. So he realized, think about this, he realized that he was not going to receive any further benefit from following Jesus, okay? He's, he's, he's running the numbers in his head. He goes, no, hold on. This ain't going to end well. Uh, and, and my cash cow... Uh, is getting ready to get, you know, is getting ready to get arrested. And so uh, what he does is he realizes this, that, and so that, for, that it would, excuse me, that he was not going to receive any further benefit from following Jesus, and that he would be paid for handling, handing him over. And so he's looking at cashing out, okay? 
I, I'm going to see, I'm going to make as much money as I can out of this deal before this ends. And so the Old Testament, the Old Testament scriptures predicted that Jesus would be betrayed by what? By a friend. Psalms, one, uh, Psalms 41, 9, if you have your Bibles, I know you do. Psalms 41, 9, let's, let's see the prophecy, okay? So was this prophesied beforehand? Well, in Psalms 41, 9, we read this. I'll give you a minute to get there. If you, got, if you highlight, this is a good one to highlight. Even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his hill against me. Think about that. That wasn't written the day before Christ was betrayed. That's back in Psalm, in one of the Psalms. And then you turn ahead, and so turn ahead. It is, it is. And so turn back, okay, now, so turn back to Mark 14, 10. So that's what we read in the Old Testament. Now this is his prophecy fulfilled, okay? Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priest to betray him to them, just as it was prophesied, okay? So let's look at this for a minute. Um, who was guiding Judas to sell Jesus? It was Satan himself, right? Now Satan hated Jesus because he was God. And because he spoke the truth about God's love for sinners and about his coming judgment on Satan and all who refused to repent and to believe on Jesus. And so the Jewish leaders agreed to pay Judas, okay? And so the Jewish leaders agreed to pay Judas money for betraying Jesus. And in verse 11, we see this. It says, and when they heard it, that's that Judas was willing to do this. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money, so he sought how he might conveniently betray him. All right, so in the Gospel of Matthew, we're told that the amount paid to Judas was how much? 30 pieces of silver, right? Now, this is the exact amount, okay? I want to show you how. How accurate God is <laughs> a tell, a foretelling what's going to happen in the future, okay? This is the exact amount that's prophesied in the Old Testament by Zechariah the prophet more than 500 years earlier. Now, I'm just going to tell you, critics of the Bible, this is what they like to, this is what they like to allege. <laughs> The Bible was written by a bunch of men and it's completely been either re redacted or added to over the years by the church and other people to influence other, other people to follow so they can make a profit off of it. That, or an argument very like that. Now, if the Old Testament canon, <coughs> which was the Bible in Jesus' time, was completed before Jesus, in the New Testament canon, you know, was commonly accepted. Remember, we studied as early as the, the, the moratorium uh, a list, which is about 150 A.D., so it was commonly accepted by most churches before that, the books, except for a couple. How can someone go back and write a prophecy in? In other words, how much did, how much did Judas sell Jesus out for? 30 pieces of silver. All right, let's go back and write that into an old prophet. It, how is that even possible with a 500 year span? Well, it's not possible except the fact that God through the prophet Zechariah told exactly how much the shepherd or the great, the good shepherd or the servant of, of God would be sold out for. 30 pieces of silver as prophesied. That's just one, okay? We've covered two tonight so far. Or is that three? I lost count. And so 500 years earlier, so Zechariah 11, uh, 12, 13, let's just go there and look real quick. Zechariah, Zechariah 12, it should be on your little chart. I believe that one's in there. Yeah, so, sorry, Zechariah 11, 
verses 12 and 13. So this is the actual prophecy that was fulfilled. Then I said to them, it is my, it is agreeable to you. Give me my wages and if not refrain. So they weighed out for my wages 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter. That princely price they set on me. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them in the house of the Lord for the potter. Okay. That word potter sticks out, right? Okay. So if you go back to math, turn to now turn to Matthew twenty-six. Okay, hang in there. So that was that's word by word the prophecy. Now we turn to Matthew. Matthew twenty-six fourteen fifteen. Matthew chapter twenty-six verses fourteen fifteen. The superscript says Jesus agrees to betray Jesus, or Judas agrees to betray Jesus, and so. It says, then one of the twelve called Judas Iscariot went to the chief priest and said, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? And they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver. 500 years from approximately 500 years from the time it was first prophesied. And it's fulfilled to the letter detail in which God had spoke to the prophet Zechariah. See that? Okay, so. So let's continue on. You guys know what that picture is in the background? I haven't been there, okay? But I have friends that's been there. That's actually reported to be the upper room. Whether it is, I don't know. Maybe they're just making a profit off of it. Uh, I hear that happens a lot in Jerusalem for a Christian tourist. Yeah, you know, I, I don't, I really don't know. Yeah, it's a good question. That'd be interesting. But at the time, think about this. It was the wages for, basically the price that you'd pay for a slave. That's what Judas sold his friend Jesus out for. Do you get it? Well, it was time for the Passover feast. And so Jesus sent some of his disciples to make preparations. And in verse tw uh, uh, Mark 14, 12, we read this. Let me go back now. Mark 14, 12. Now on the first day of unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, where do you want us to go and prepare that you may eat the Passover? And so uh, what event did the Jews celebrate each year at this religious feast? What were they celebrating? Uh, but what? But what was it? Yeah, that's right. It was the time when God spared the firstborn of their ancestors and delivered them from Egypt. Okay, and so what? What had God instructed the Israelites to do in order to spare their firstborn from death? Yeah, that's right. To kill a lamb and to sprinkle the blood on the doorposts of their houses. Right. And uh, Jesus' disciples asked him where they were to prepare the feast for this very important celebration. So that, that's where we're at. So Jesus told them to uh, where to actually make the preparations too. Now look here in verses 13 and 14. And Mark it says, And he sent out two of his disciples and said to them, Hey, go in the city and, make a man, or, and a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him. And wherever he goes in, say to the master of the house, the teacher says, Where is the guest room in which... I may eat the Passover with my disciples. And in verse 15, then he will show you a large upper room furnished and prepared there make ready for us. And so these are the instructions that Jesus gave the disciples. And so Jesus told two of these disciples that they would meet a man carrying a water jug. Okay. <laughs> How uncommon do you think it was for a man to be carrying a water jug? Now, this would have been an unusual thing to see because the work of drawing water from a well and carrying it home was generally a woman's task. And so how could Jesus know exactly what would happen? 
I mean, every week, folks, it hasn't changed. <laughs> it's the standard Bible, you know, Sunday school answer, right? Uh, he, he's all knowing. And so he knows even the smallest and the seemingly insignificant thing. Even when one little sparrow falls to the ground and dies, right? That's what scripture tells us. And so Mark 14, 16, we read this. It says, so his disciples went out and came into the city and found it just as he had said to them. And they prepared the Passover. Now, let's just take a minute and put ourselves in the, in the disciples' shoes, okay? Just think of everything that we've been an eyewitness to during this time. Is, is there any more surprises left in what Jesus can do or what he knows? There shouldn't be, right? I mean, oh, the master, the you know, rabbi said, go in the town, there's going to be a guy. Okay, but when, that's a woman's job. Okay, but Jesus said there's going to be a guy carrying a water pot. So let's just start walking. Oh, look, there, there's a guy with a water pot. <laughs> hey, we're supposed to tell you something. <laughs> I mean, think about this. Uh, why is it so hard then for us? Why do you think it was still so hard for them? Well, we're going to see here in the upper room. Well, Mark 14, 16, we had read that these disciples went out and they actually found what Jesus told them they would find. And so, uh, now think about this. Now we're in this part that Jesus knew that Judas would betray him. Now, if you knew that you guys were going out to eat and the person that has been your friend and with you for three, three and a half years if you knew he was going to betray you, okay, that night, how would you act? You go. <laughs> okay, yeah, Sue would go home. Okay, what about the rest of you people? <laughs> you would what? Yeah. I mean, okay, I would at least make him pay for dinner. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but I mean, think about this: to to know that you're going to be betrayed, who's going to betray you? This is just this is amazing. All right, and so Jesus Jesus knew what was in Judas Judas's heart. Okay, and it's really important. We don't know what someone in someone's heart, but God does. He knows even the intentions of the thoughts of their heart, and so. In, in, in Mark 14, 17 through 20, we read this. They said in the evening, he came with the 12. And now as they sat and ate, Jesus said, Surely I say to you, one of you who eats with me will betray me. And then we read, and they began to be sorrowful and to say to him one by one, Is it I? And another said, Is it I? He answered and said to them, it is the one of the twelve who dips with me in the dish. The Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had never been born. So I went just a little bit further, okay? But I'm going to read that one again here in a minute. Jesus knew all that Judas was thinking and planning. How many times have you thought something that you knew was sinful and you planned to even do it and thinking that somehow no one knew what you were up to? We would all raise our hand numerous times and our feet and say, yeah, there's times that I've actually plotted to do wrong, thinking that somehow I was going to be able to hide it. Well, Jesus knew Judas's heart. Hebrews 4.13 says this. It says, There is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. And so Jesus said that Jesus said that he would be betrayed by the one eating with him from the same dish. Okay? So very specific once again. And so when the Jews ate together, it was their custom to break pieces of bread from the loaves on the table and to dip them into a large bowl of sauce in the center. Now that sauce was usually made from mashed fruit, okay? And so you get the picture. Uh, and so 
Even while Judas was dipping his hand, or excuse me, his bread in the same bowl as Jesus and acting as a good friend, what was he planning to do? To betray him, to sell Jesus out to his enemies. Even while he was doing that. Now, I don't want us to miss the significance of this, okay? Because we lose it with the cultural bridge that we have to cross, you know, 2,000 years from this. And so this was this was a, tra- a, a traitorous thing, or, yeah, a traitorous thing for Judas to do. Why? Well, in Jewish culture, it was considered unthinkable to harm a person in any way after having eaten at his table. And Jesus was the host of this meal. Can you think about this, okay? And we have to ask ourselves why. Jesus, who knows Judas's heart, And his thoughts. Knows that Judas is going to betray him. And now here Judas. Dips from the same bowl as him. Which even in in their their custom. Was was a treacherous insult. And act. Why would he do this? Well. I want you to think about this. Jesus had told the, the 12 apostles. That one of them. The one dipping in the same bowl of sauce with him. So Jesus is dipping. He's got his broke bread. The other guy that he's talking about is going to break his bread or take his bread. And together, they're going to dip dip into that mass fruit substance. And that would be the guy. He said the one dipping with him would be the one that would betray him. He said this. Why? Why? I've missed this because Jesus wanted Judas to really consider what he was planning to do. And so considering that Jesus knew or that yeah that Jesus knew Judas' intention, why would he give Judas this opportunity if that's the case? To, why would he give him the opportunity to repent? What about because he loved him? Even though he knew he was going to betray him. Now, we're like, oh, no. If he's going to betray me, that's it. It's over with. Uh, I'm not doing anything else for him. But do you think this is a a possibility? If Jesus really allowed him a chance to do, even if he didn't allow him a chance, even if it was predestined to happen that way, Jesus is all, he's all, He's an all benevolent king and Lord. True, true. Now, now think about this, okay? It also hurt Jesus deeply that Judas, one of his chosen disciples and constant companions, would betray him. Well, how is that the case? Well, because remember, you have God, the God man. God, Jesus didn't give any of his deity up when he took on his, his human part, man. Who was Mary the mother of? Was Mary the mother of God? Mary was the mother of Jesus. Okay, so remember there's a part of Jesus that's suffering and he's not sinning, but the humanity, the human part of him is like, if there's any other way, this is going to be, this is going to be a horrible, if there's any other way. And I think the same reason why he, he wept at, at Lazarus when, when he went there and he actually wept and he actually, he actually hurt for, for the effects of sin. And so we see this throughout. And, and so what, I, you know, I, I believe they're correct here that, that Jesus was allowing Judas a chance to at least consider what he was doing and, and perhaps even repent of this. But uh, he was willing to do that because he loved him. But it also hurt him greatly to be to know that this this companion of three years th- these weren't guys that just met on on Sundays, okay? Yes. These were people that did life together. Yes, Peter. That's right, he did. So these are guys that had done life and ministry together, and so well, let's take it a little further. But in a few hours, he calls him son. That's right. In a few hours, he does, and so. Uh, Let's look here. Judas would be punished for betraying the deliverer, okay? And there's always consequences 
Uh, you choose not to repent, there's consequence for that. You repent of your sins and you put your trust in God, then you receive, you know, uh, favorable consequences of, of that decision. And so in, in, in Mark 14, 21, we read this. It says, The Son of Man indeed goes, just as it is written of him, but woe to the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had never been born. Wow. Well, why did Jesus often refer to himself as the Son of Man? You're like, where'd that come from? <laughs> did Jesus ever refer to himself as Son of Man? Did Scripture ever talk about Jesus? We had a memory verse. Remember, remember the verse out of Psalms? When I, when I look at the heavens and work of your fingers, the moon and the star which you set in place, what is man that you're mindful of? Him? The son of man that you care for him, yet you've made him a little lower than heavenly beings, and you've crowned him with, with glory and honor. You've uh, put all things, uh, un, uh, all things, uh, what is it? Given him dominion over the works of your hands. You put all things under his feet. Son of man. So I think it's 78 times that it's used in the New Testament talking of Christ. So look at this passage. The Son of Man is capitalized, okay? Indeed goes, just as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. And so Jesus is talking about himself here, okay? And so because although he was the Son of God, he was also a real man too. He wasn't just God that had to give the appearance of man. He was all God and all man. His purpose for coming to earth as a man was to give his life so that we might be reconciled to God. Jesus knew that he had to die just as God had foretold through the prophets. And so even though the only way for us to be reconciled to God was for Jesus to die, God did not make Judas betray Jesus. He did not make him betray, okay? Judas was still responsible for betraying him and would be punished forever for his terrible deed. Yes, ma'am. One of the first verses we read in the lesson said that the high priest had already decided to kill him. And they probably were unaware of the death penalty. Yeah. So they probably didn't know that he had showed up or not. Yeah. That's, that's a great point. It's a great point. We see, this, we see this through here. So does this make this argument easier? <laughs> are harder for us trying to reconcile this. I see a lot of pontification going on. Well, let, let's work a little bit further through, okay? Well, Jesus used bread as a symbol of his body. And in 1422, we read this. And as they were eating... Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them and said, Take, eat. This is my body. Now, Jesus took some bread and broke it, explaining that just as the bread had been broken, so his body would soon be broken by wicked men. Okay? Jesus used wine as a symbol of his blood. In verses 23 to 24, we read this. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. And so after breaking the bread, Jesus picked up the cup of wine, which he then gave to them to drink, and he likened this wine to his blood that would be shed for them and others. And when Jesus died, he would be given his life instead of us having to be punished forever. And in verse 25 and 26 we read, he says, Surely I say to you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the, the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So, it says here, I'm going to read this because you, this isn't a novice group of Bible students. It says, teacher, although this is the last point, the gospel comes into focus. It says, it'd be best to wait until you teach the account of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ in Lesson 47 before fully presenting the gospel with the whole group. However, if individuals inquire about their personal need of salvation, you can share the gospel with them privately. And so 
Do you see why the things are ordered this way? Why we're teaching it this way? Because it becomes clear for people that, that have no knowledge of God's, what God's divine plan to save them. Lesson 45, they're at the point of saying, they're, they're, they should be concerned about their eternal destination by this point. And they're, and they're learning that it's Christ. That even if He's going to be betrayed, that God's going to bring about this perfect plan that He promised, this deliverer, all the way back so long ago and like 40 something, you know, 38 lessons ago. And so it's coming so much clearer here, okay? Well, let's look at this. Jesus' mission was what? It was completely misunderstood by many. Do we agree with that? They're laying palm branches down. He's riding in and they're saying, Hosanna, Hosanna. Uh, and, there's, and many of them are saying, this is the deliverer that's been promised to us. He's going to overthrow and take off the yoke of, of the Romans and, and all these people that we've been enslaved to. And, and we're going to be free once again. We're going to be a people. We're going to be great like the time during David and, and the time when all 12 tribes were together, when all of Israel was together. And then there was others uh, that were saying, uh, I think we can profit off of this guy. This, is, this guy's a miracle worker. I mean, this, this guy's a cash cow. We can make a lot of money off this. And, but then there was those, some, that understood that this was the deliverer that come to take away the sins of the world. But many misunderstood. The people who welcomed Jesus into Jerusalem as king soon turned away when he didn't give them what they wanted. Neither did Judas find in Jesus what he was looking for. Well, the reason they didn't understand Jesus' mission was because they didn't see their own need as sinner. Now think about this. Jesus knew that people's greatest need was to be delivered from sin, Satan, and death. But the majority who saw and heard Jesus failed to even see this. They thought that their greatest need was for health, wealth, and a good life in the here and now. And that's true today, too. They were only looking at their temporal, physical, and material needs. Jesus' greatest interest was in their eternal, spiritual need. And so we're going to stop there. Uh, deal with a couple questions. But I want to do something here. I want to tell a little story that I hope kind of ties all this together, okay? After being involved in a serious car crash, a man with eternal injuries was rushed to the hospital emergency department. But unaware of his inner life-threatening pro problems, the patient's great concern was for the doctor to attend to a bad gash on his arm. Most people are taken up with their outward need are take, are taken up with their outward needs, but God's more interested in our inner needs. And throughout his life and again at the end of his ministry, Jesus focused attention on our greatest need to be delivered from the everlasting punishment from our sins. The people who had really valued Jesus were those who saw themselves as God saw them, helpless sinners. Do you see the illustration of the story? The guy had life-threatening things going on, but he was worried about something superficial. And the same for us today. We're worried about our comfort. We're worried about our pleasure. Uh, we, we live by the motto, the mantra, I just want to be happy uh, and, and completely overlooking the fact that we have a much greater need. And it's only Jesus that can take care of that need for us.